you. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here, and I've, I've really appreciated the talk so far. So this one will actually dovetail on some of the comments. And what I'll be talking about today is the issue of protein rarity. And this is um, a really significant issue. It's basically how hard would it be for a random search through sequence space to come across a functional protein? And the context of this will be in the argument for irreducible complexity. So I'm sure most of you are very familiar with this argument. The basic idea is that as you look at these biological machines, you have multiple parts, all of which have to be perfectly interconnected for these machines to work. Like the, the poster child would be the bacterial flagellum. And the question of how hard is it to actually get a bacterial flagellum really gets into the issue of how hard is it to get a protein. Because as you're familiar, the common objection to the idea of irreducible complexity, the idea that you have to have all these different parts, is that perhaps the proteins existed in other machines. So perhaps you've got bacterial proteins in several other machines, so all you have to do is borrow them to create a bacterial flagellum. Or perhaps you might start with a simpler machine, like an injectosome, a type 3 secretion system, and you add a few more pieces and then you've got your flagellum. So um, I'll address the rarity of proteins in that larger context. And what I'll do is I really focus on the question of imagining that you have a fully functional bacterial flagellum and all you're missing is the flagellar filament which acts like the propeller. So how hard would it be to get the last piece, essentially? Well, to give you a sense of the difficulty, let's first talk about this last piece. So you have your hook in place now, to get the filament, what has to happen is you actually need four proteins. You have to have two proteins that act like a joint that connects the hook to the flagellar filament. And then obviously you've got to have the protein that produces the filament. And then you have to have an assembly cap, um, a, 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 which is a fly D protein, which actually is the assembly tool. It's like an Allen wrench, crudely speaking, if you're trying to assemble a piece of furniture. So here's a, an animation. And what we see is you have your construction of your filament where you have your two joint proteins. Then you have your cap protein that comes into place which is the assembly tool. And then you've got your proteins, fly C, which produces your filament. And then fly D is your assembly tool. So to get your last piece, your propeller, so to speak, is you've got to have those four proteins. So let's talk about the difficulty of getting just one protein. And this goes back <coughs> into the research of Doug Axe which he popularized in his book, Undeniable. And this is his original JMB article that talked about how he estimated the chance of a random sequence producing a functional, um, in this case, it's, uh, it, it, it's going to be a particular enzyme. And the chance of getting this particular domain in this enzyme uh, is going to be like 1 in 10 to the 77. And the chance of a random sequence basically producing a stable structure to produce the beta lactamase or any type of stable structure would be like 1 in 10 to the 74. Now, of course, there's been a lot of um, people that have attacked his research, not surprisingly. And I'm going to talk about the rarity of proteins from a totally different perspective. I'm going to talk about the thermodynamic issues of protein folds. And for those of you not familiar with proteins, they're basically uh, sequences of amino acids. And you have, in the case of the beta lactamase fold I'm talking about, about 153 amino acids. And what happens is these amino acids, when they're produced by the ribosome, is they start to fold. And if it's much more complex, I won't go into the details. And what happens is these proteins are going to begin to fold. There we go. And they form secondary structures like alpha helixes and, and, and beta sheets. And then those secondary structures form into a protein domain, which would be an independent folding unit of a protein. So that's what that looks like. Now, uh, there's a lot of different folds out there for many different purposes. They form enzymes, the structures of your, of your cells, and so forth. And what happens, you can group uh, protein folds into the larger folds. Then you have superfamilies, and then you have families. And a superfamily basically has a common motif. And then a family is basically uh, proteins with the same basic structure and they often will have the same function. And there's many different measurements for what uh, which accounts for the same protein family, but a, but a crude estimate that some people use is about 35% similarity in the amino acids. So that would be within the same fold, the same fold a family is about 35%. Now, within a particular protein family, you have a certain number of proteins within that family, and the number ranges from just one, uh, many have just one, 
up to thousands. But 90% would have 1,000 proteins within a family or less. That's your typical protein family has less than 1,000 proteins. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about how hard would it be to hit a target corresponding to a specific protein fold. How difficult is that? And what I'm going to talk about is if you start with, let's say, a random sequence, and you're trying to hit a specific uh, protein. In this case, I'm going to talk about FlyD, which has roughly 500 amino acids. And the other proteins I mentioned that, that are essential for the filament would have roughly 500 amino acids. Three have roughly 500. One is a bit less. It's in the, it's in the 300s. So if you start with a random sequence, what has to happen is this random search has to get within the neighborhood of a protein family, then within the neighborhood of a protein, and then finally you have to hit a functional sequence. So I'm going to talk about each of these challenges. Now, when you think about changes to a protein, like you have a gene duplication, and now you're going to modify that one protein and a new protein, what happens is mutations don't directly interact with amino acids. Obviously, they're going to deal with your DNA code. And every amino acid will correspond <coughs> to a, a codon or three nucleotides in your, your gene. And what happens is this third nucleotide is uh, often redundant. Either it could be any particular nucleotide here would be the same amino acid, or perhaps two, or perhaps three, or perhaps one. So um, as a crude estimate, if you have, let's say, a 500 amino acid protein, like with your flagellar fil uh, filament proteins I'll be talking about, that would correspond to over a thousand <coughs> nucleotide target. Okay, and that's going to be an important number as you, as, as you see shortly. So what happens is if you want to talk about the difficulty of hitting a target, which is about a thousand nucleotides long, I'm going to refer to the re research of Martin Novak. And it's always terrifying to refer to research of someone in the room. So if I turn deathly ill, that's because he's given me a scowl look. So we'll <laughs> find out. And what happens is within his research, he's had, uh, there's several important uh, results I want to get to. But basically the way it works is he talks about a center sequence, and then he has a target where the target corresponds to a random search, which gets within, let's say, 50% accuracy of your center sequence. So that would be like half of the, the nucleotides are the same, but it, perhaps half could be different. Or you could talk about a 30% target, where about 70% of the nucleotides are the same, and then 30% could be different. His actual research is a third, so 33% is better, but I'll just use 30% for a reason I'll get into shortly. Now, um, what happens is there's a couple important findings. One is if you imagine that you start your random search just a few steps away from your target, what happens is your initial uh, mutations, your initial changes will most likely lead you away from the target, not towards it. So the average time necessary to hit the target would be the same on average as if it was from a random sequence. And that's really important. He's nodding. That gives me great relief. So what happens, this gets into the co-option argument, because what happens is um, the argument is that you have what's called an injectosome or a type 3 secretion system in an injectosome. And there's lots of similar proteins between your flagellar uh, injectosome and your, uh, your, your flagellar type 3 secretion system and the injectosome. Now here's what's key. They're similar proteins. They're not identical. Because often you'll hear that you have these proteins that already exist, so they can be borrowed to be part of your flagellar filament. That is not true. They're homologous. They're not identical. And now thanks to the research of Jonathan McClatchy, what he did is he actually looked at how similar are these actual proteins. Now, within the injectosome, you have about seven proteins which are very high in similarity. So these are the most similar proteins. And if you look at the uh, area that overlaps, you have actually less than 50% identity in the amino acids. So what happens is the uh, target of the flagellar protein is far enough away from your starting uh, uh, injectosome proteins that it takes as long to reach the target as if it was from a random search. That's the first key that's really, really important. So you're dealing essentially from what's equivalent to starting with a random sequence and then from that random sequence hitting a new flagellar protein. Now, another key re uh, result of Martin Novak is that if you have a 50% target, it's going to take about uh, 10 to the 65 steps to reach that target. So each step would be one random amino acid or one random nucleotide change. So that's like 10 to the 65 steps to hit the target. Now, why is this, this one half important? Because I mentioned that inside the same protein family, you have about 35% similarity in amino acids. 
So you have about 35% of the same amino acids, but then of the 65% that aren't the same, about a quarter of your nucleotides will be the same purely by chance. And it's a very uh, tightly peaked binomial distribution. So what you have is getting within a protein family is roughly the same as a 50% target. It's a very crude estimate, and it's not the most important figure, but this is just sort of the start of the conversation. So what happens is if you start with a random sequence to get within the family of a protein target, you need about 10 to the 65 uh, steps to get there. And the chance if every single organism on the Earth was searching for this target, there would still be only about 1 in 10 to the six, uh, 26 chance that you would even get in the vicinity of a protein family. So that would be discouraging at first. <laughs> but now we're going to talk about what does it take to get inside the, the vicinity of a protein target where there's at least some chance you're going to hit a functional sequence. Well, just as, a, as, as sort of a ballpark figure, there's roughly about a million protein families. But those protein families, if, you're, if they're not orphan genes, that's more complex, but your typical proteins that are shared by multiple organisms, uh, there's only about 15,000 what are called uh, sequence profiles, which refer to single domain architectures. So of the million known protein families, what you find is they're composed of combinations of only about 15,000 separate targets that number is not growing. The number of protein families is being growing quite rapidly, but this number is not, with the possible exception of orphan genes, which are unique to specific species. So what you see is you only have a certain number of targets, but the chance of hitting any target is very, very small. So that's the situation. Now, I'm gonna start with the assumption that a protein target is roughly gonna be a 30% target. I could have used 33% to match Novak's work, but roughly 30%, and I'll explain why in a moment. And what happens is within the context of Novak's research, uh, the number of time steps you would need to get to a target of 33% is like 10 to the power of 170. So that's gonna be a very, very difficult search. Now the question becomes, is that realistic for a protein target? Is it bigger, is it smaller? And I'm gonna go into, uh, oh, as a, as a side note, there's only about 1,000 proteins within a protein family, just to give you um, an, a ballpark number to compare 10 to the 170th to 10 to the third of the number of proteins that are known in protein families. Well, just to give you a, number, a sense of these numbers, the volume of a proton compared to the volume of the visible universe is like 1 in 10 to the 125. So that's just to kind of compare these numbers. Well, again, you need, you need about uh, 10 to the 170th steps to actually hit the protein target on average. Well, to get into the issue of exactly how rare are the ta ta of the, these targets, I'll get into the, the research of Dan Tofik, who's at the Weizmann Institute. And what he did is he looked at the effect of mutations on protein stability. Now, the reason a protein folds is because a folded protein is at a lower free energy than an unfolded protein. That's why you have a protein fold, because it's energetically favorable to go from the unfolded state to the folded state. And this is about uh, 10 kilogat calories per mole. So that's about 10 kilocalories per mole. That's a ballpark figure. What uh, Tofik found is as you, uh, mutations accumulate, there's typically some threshold. So as mutations accumulate, your stability drops, meaning the difference in free energy drops, and the protein can tolerate that. So protein can tolerate a few mutations, but as you get beyond the threshold, the stability quickly drops and then you essentially have non-functional states. So the question is, how fast is this drop? Well, if you look at his research, what he found is when you look at experimental studies on how much the free energy drops for a given mutation, what uh, Tofik found is if you look at many different proteins, and this actually is, um, he did this for 16 actual proteins in life and a few others that were manufactured in the lab. He found that the distribution of the drop of stability, how much the free energy difference drops, is remarkably similar for all these different proteins. So all these 16 proteins had a remarkably similar protein a profile in terms of the probability of a mutation decreasing the stability by a certain amount. So what happens is about two-thirds of mutations will drop the stability of a protein either moderately or severely and that's like a drop of one kilocalorie per mole or greater. And about one in 20 will actually stabilize the protein. It'll make it more stable or it could potentially undo the destabilizing effect. And about a third is gonna be, a 30% is gonna be neutral. Now, this is a little artificial because 
even mutations which, destab which stabilize the protein can actually eliminate function. So you might hit an active site, a protein or a, 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 an amino acid in an active site, which eliminates function even though it's stabilizing. So it's actually worse than what these statistics suggest. Well, again, and I mentioned that this is universal. 16 separate proteins of different sizes, different functions have the same profile. So this is really remarkably similar. And what happens is a lot of research that looked at even in more uh, experimental uh, research on the drop of stability for mutations and computational studies, like a lot of the research he did was with computational studies using things like FoldX, which is very popular, other computational studies, all consistently showed that the average drop of stability is one kilocalorie per mole or greater. And the standard deviation is about 1.7. So again, most mutations on average will destabilize. Why is that significant? Well, what happens, your typical protein will have somewhere between 3 and 10, at the most roughly 15, kilocalories per mole of stability. So you have 15 units of stability for protein. Each mutation on average drops one unit. So therefore, after 10 or 15 mutations, your protein should be totally destabilized. Very straightforward math. Now, if you look at the standard deviation, and what you do is you ask what will happen as mutations accumulate, <coughs> what you'll find is that well before you change 30% of the protein, virtually every combination of mutations will completely destabilize the protein. So that's why that 30% target is really significant, because that is a very conservative target for what is the region that you have any hope at all of finding a functional sequence. Very, very significant. Now, and again, uh, Tofik argued, uh, referenced research that said that the destabilization of multiple mutations, he, he referenced research is roughly the sum of the individuals, but he argued it's actually worse. That's called negative epistasis, that you actually have worse than the sum of the destabilization of the, of the mutation. So a sum would be a, a conservative estimate. So the target is going to be less than 30%. But let's talk about what is actual experimental evidence. Because remember I talked about how uh, many of the mutations which stabilize actually remove function? So that 30% target is actually very, very, very conservative. So let's look at what the evidence actually suggests. So if you look at his research on beta-lactamase, for instance, what happens, he talked about how the, the fitness drops with accumulated mutations. And he defined fitness is that if you've got, let's say, and this is the same approach Doug Axe used, if you've got a population of bacteria with random mutations, the fitness would be the percentage of bacteria that would survive with that certain number of mutations. So what happens is almost all of the bacteria uh, will not survive in various environments after roughly 16 mutations. But remember, a lot of the mutations to the DNA are what are called synonymous mutations. They don't change the amino acids, right? So if you look at just the mutations that change the amino acids, uh, what happens is it's even faster. So what you have is a drop um, of about, after like 10 mutations with beta-lactamase, almost all of the bacteria will not survive. Uh, this is uh, research on HIS-A, which is an enzyme that's used in the production of histidine. And again, what you find is that after even fewer mutations, virtually all of your bacteria will be non-functional. The, uh, the, the uh, enzyme is completely destabilized. So again, the actual target is if you look at the length of the enzyme, is this is about 10% target, while only about 3% the HIS-A is going to be totally non-functional for virtually every combination of mutations that change about 3% of the amino acids. So what happens is a little more complex because if this represents a 10% target, then the actual target may be even smaller, like 3 to 4%. And the, uh, the number of sequences here is about 90 orders of magnitude smaller than here. So this is obviously not drawn to scale. But it's more complex because what happens is, as I mentioned, there are mutations that stabilize. So you can have very, very narrow corridors to sequence space where you have functional sequences. So the actual difference between sequences could be more than 10%, but the size of the target would be 10% would be very conservative because of that. And now why is that significant? Well, let me ask those of you who were raised in English-speaking countries as the primary language, do you recognize, raise your hand if you recognize this paragraph. Okay, that's encouraging. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as I figured the folks from English-speaking countries, it's, the, the paragraph is, is from Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow. It's a nursery rhyme.
Now, again, you can still read this even though 10% of the letters randomly changed. And I actually literally used a random number generator off of Excel. I don't know how random it is, but it's the best I could do. So what that means is that functional sequences are more rare than English paragraphs. That's key. Now, if you look again at, let's say, at your fly D gene uh, protein, it's like 500 uh, amino acids long. So this would be the size of a paragraph that corresponds to these flagellar proteins. So imagine you start with a random sequence, and you randomly change letters until this would be as readable uh, this would be as readable as this. This is the sort of rarity we're dealing with. Now, you can talk about what would be the probability of, of finding a sequence like this at random. Uh, in other words, you have a target sequence and you want to get within, let's say, 90% accuracy. Well, you can simply use a binomial distribution to, to calculate the odds with a normal approximation. And what happens, going back to uh, this picture, is the probability of a random search, this isn't the search time, it's a random search, hitting the protein target at 10% is about 1 in 10 to the 400 if it's confined within the protein family. So that's how difficult it is to hit these protein targets. Now, you might say, or someone might say, that yes, maybe hitting the protein target of a specific fly D protein is extremely rare, but maybe sequence space is just filled, it's saturated with protein targets. So maybe there's actually 10 to the power of 390 targets, which all could fulfill the role of fly D. Like they're a different version of fly D, or they're a different protein that actually does, does the job. Well, that is an interesting idea, but the problem is, if that were the case, you would expect bacteria to have stumbled across far more protein families and proteins within families than, let's say, eukaryotes, because there's a lot more bacteria. So there's like 10 to the 30 bacteria, there's about 10 to the 27 eukaryotes, um, pro prokaryotes versus eukaryotes, or something like trees is even smaller. Here you're dealing with like three orders of magnitude, here you're dealing with like 20 orders of magnitude. And what happens is that's just not the case. If you look at the number of protein families unique to bacteria versus eukaryotes, the number of proteins within those families, it's just not that different. And the same with trees. Like ash trees, you have about 25% of the genes in ash trees are orphan genes. They're unique to those, to those species. And it's like 20% in, in E. coli. So you're not seeing a lot more proteins in bacteria than other organisms. So it's not just that the space is super saturated with, with protein targets. Well, the last question is, let's imagine you're within a protein target, and now you want to actually find a functional sequence within that target. How hard would that be? Well, going back to Tofik's research, what he found is that after about six mutations in beta-lactamase, uh, in the same thing you see in his, his A, about, again, about a third of the following uh, mutations would be functional. And that's important because that goes right back to the studies of, of the way mutations drop the free energy. Because remember I talked about how two-thirds of mutations destabilize, either moderately or significantly? So after about six mutations, you're at the very, very edge of a stable protein, at the very edge. And then two-thirds of mutations will push you over the edge. So what you're seeing is that this fits that really nicely. So what happens then? is you can ask the question, how likely is it for you to hit a, ran a, a sequence which is functional within your protein target? Well, what happens is, again, the probability that a sequence is functional as you move away from your center sequence, a highly optimized protein, drops by about a third every step. However, the number of sequences that are one step away from a center sequence would be about 500 times a 500 uh, ways you can move one step away from a center sequence of 500 length. Uh, two steps would be 500 times 499, three steps, et cetera, et cetera. So what that means, if you multiply these together, that there's far, far, far more functional sequences at the edge of functionality than with a highly optimized protein. And at the edge of functionality, as I mentioned, about a third of the mutations will be functional, two thirds will be non-functional. So that suggests, uh, if you go to like Cauchy's mean value theorem, that roughly the probability of hitting a functional sequence is roughly one-third to the power of L, where L is the length of your sequence. Well, if you look at, let's say, a beta-lactamase domain that Doug Ack studied, 
and you take like a third to a power of 153, that means the probability based on this crude estimate is like one in 10 to the negative 73. What was Doug Ack's results for a functional sequence? About one in 10 to the 74. So this is a very, uh, seems like a reasonable estimate. So going back to the uh, protein I was talking about, your fly D, the chance of hitting a functional sequence is something like less than one in 10 to the power of 200. So again, what this means is that hitting these functional targets is so unlikely, it's not plausible through a random search. That's the big message. But if you're talking about, again, producing your flagellar filament, it's not just a matter of getting, let's say, the fly D. You also have to get the, the flagellar filament proteins and your junction proteins. And what happens is that essentially is equivalent of a sequence, which is much, much longer and the length of time required to hit a sequence grows exponentially with the length. So hitting a target of basically this extra flagellar piece is implausible from a random search. Now, what happens also is you really see teleology or purpose. Because what has to happen is to get this extra filament, you have to not just get the, the four proteins, but they have to be produced at the right time, and you have to get a sequence um, the right sequence within those proteins, which will be a basically a signal sequence that allows them to pass through the transport gate at the right time so they form in the right, uh, in the right order. And this is an assembly tool. It's assembling the flagellum, which points to teleology. Thank you.